What good is Thanksgiving without a little football conversation? We've got you covered here today. Happy Thanksgiving. We're talking about Mike Elko and the Duke Blue Devils football team. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. So great to have you here with us on Thursday, November 23rd, 2023. Happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners out there. Hope that you're getting a chance to spend some time with loved ones today and share all those amazing things that you're thankful for in your everyday life. On today's show, we're going to be talking about Duke football. Thanksgiving's a day that you kind of associate with football, so why not talk about Mike Elko and the Duke Blue Devils? Here today on the program, one game remaining in the regular season for those guys. We'll talk about that, a little bit of the season so far, and a whole lot more with our good pal Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 Podcasts. If you have not done so already, please be sure to follow and subscribe to Lockdown Blue Devils for free wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Watch our show on YouTube each and every day. Hit the subscribe button to our YouTube channel as well. Your support means just so much to us here at Lockdown Blue Devils. So without further ado, let's bring on the aforementioned my good pal, Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. Happy Thanksgiving, my friend. Thanks for being with me today. Yeah, man. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope, hope you're uh, being able to spend some time with family today and, you know, eat some uh, eat some turkey and some ham and whatever you do. So I'm personally a green bean casserole fan. So like I'll be spending extra time there. So I that's tell people side. that's my favorite dish. I, yeah. I We've never discussed this before, but no, absolutely, I need green bean casserole in my life. So I'm yeah. glad we agree on that. Let us know in the comments below what your Thanksgiving dish of choice is, and uh, let's see the kind of responses that we can get. Well, Josh, we think about Thanksgiving. We've got uh, three big NFL games up on the docket today. We've also got uh, you know, something like the Egg Bowl even is played yep. annually on Thanksgiving when you get that fun rivalry game between Ole Miss and Mississippi State. So uh, why not have a little bit uh, Duke football conversation here on today's show? One week left in the season, and uh, of course we got to start with what happened most recently, a really tough loss for Duke when they went to Charlottesville to take on Virginia. Yeah, you know, you could really kind of see it, the perfect storm kind of coming together. UVA had started playing better, uh, even though they they didn't get the win against Louisville. They really should have beaten Louisville. Uh, they were up in the fourth quarter and allowed the Cardinals to come back and beat them. So they had been playing much better. Calandria, their quarterback, a true freshman, had planned on redshirting, similar to Grayson Loftus. And so you see his progression. Um, and then that those – I mean, Malik Washington and Malachi Fields were just really solid. So, yeah, Duke goes up there. They don't – seemingly don't have the energy um, that, that was needed uh, to, to, to come back with a with an ACC road victory. And uh, those are not easy uh, to do. And so Duke fell a little bit short. Now, talking about the game more for this Duke football team, it really has kind of been a, a downward trend for Duke after such an amazing start to the season, a year that's had so many highs and lows, uh, including being ranked in the top 25, getting the chance to Post college game day, have these big time games played at home, and it's just been uh, uh, tough to watch some of the things that have taken place over the last few weeks. Uh, does it all go back to quarterback, or I mean, what, what what's kind of been the mm-hmm. biggest shift? Would you say? Yeah, I mean, Duke's lost four out of the last six, and no no one likes that. But uh, you you have to look at at the the quarterback injury, <sighs> and then other injuries. It's not just the quarterback injury. I mean, last season Duke went uh, ended up nine and four for the season. And they were so fortunate on the injury front. There were just a, a couple of, uh, of of injury issues throughout the season. And this season, man, it's been it's been crazy. There was one game, you know, where there were multiple multiple starters out. There's been several games where there's been three, four, five starters that are not playing. And so that includes Riley Leonard. And and listen, Grayson Loftus has done incredible uh, incredible job. And if you look at the first game, second game, third game, you can easily see his progression. Um, but it's different than Riley. They're not running Grayson because 
There's nobody to back him up really except Jordan Moore. So that's one element of Duke's game that Riley Linder was able to bring to the table that we're not we don't get. So yeah, you're right, JJ. It does have to do with injuries. That's not an excuse. Um, but this is the reality. Duke was going in to the fourth quarter in Tallahassee, up three. That happens. Duke yeah. was going to win the Notre Dame game before that, fourth and 16. I mean, I don't want to do this, but I know Duke fans have been – we've been seeing on Twitter and, and dialogue. Has there ever been a more pivotal play than fourth and 16 in the Notre Dame game? If Duke gets the stop there, the game's over. They're kneeling the ball down. Riley Leonard does not get injured. Yeah. And we may not be talking about any of this stuff. Yeah, no, it's crazy to go back to that one single play and how it could have shifted everything and uh, what it would look like for Riley Leonard. Obviously, a big decision's coming for him in regards to his future. Uh, he will definitely be playing on Sundays in some form or fashion in his future uh, at the next level. We'll just have to wait and see how soon he kind of wants to make that jump and that pivot considering how things kind of turned here at the end of this season, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it, obviously his numbers weren't gaudy. And even when he was playing, just because of the competition level, um, his numbers weren't great. Um, so, you know, the, he kind of came back down to earth there. But at the end of the day, the NFL scouts see through stats. Um, you know, you, you see guys that just have the talent that they know they can go to the next level. And I certainly think Riley has that. I don't personally. I think he'll, he, he would do that. Um, but I know that he has the ability. Locked on Blue Devils here today. J.J. Jackson alongside my pal Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. You got to tell me a little bit about the Section 17 podcast, Josh. What do people need to know? Yeah, well, so we're a Duke football podcast. Uh, we're in our fourth season, and uh, we try to bring you in-depth uh, analysis of the Duke program. We are media credentialed, so we have some behind-the-scenes access there, but we also try to keep a fan's perspective. And so that's a unique kind of way we look at things. Uh, we have to toe the line sometimes with Duke, uh, but we try to get you uh, behind the scenes access. And for you to feel like you as a fan are a, a, a part of the program, that's really what we try to do. So we release podcasts every Tuesday morning uh, throughout the season. You can find them anywhere you, you listen to podcasts, YouTube, uh, just search for Duke Football Talk Section 17 podcast. And we would, uh, we'd appreciate the support. Thank you, JJ. I say this often, but thank you for having me on on a weekly basis. And uh, I mean, football seasons, we, we started talking football, JJ, back in what, July, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. It's been a long season, man. And so uh, we've talked it from the beginning to the end. And so I appreciate you having me on every week. And how about you and I on Thanksgiving wearing some Section 17 podcast gear? That That's Where right. can people find some of these things, Josh? Where yeah, you can go to dukefootballtalk.com. Um, and we have a shop there. You can buy anything you want there. And uh, we really appreciate the support. It's really cool for us to see in Wallace Wade and on social media, people wearing our merch is pretty cool. So, you know, yeah, we, we do appreciate the support. Make sure you go check it all out. Section 17 podcast with Josh Cox here on the program today. So talking a little bit about this season for Duke football, looking at some of their numbers that the team has had this season, uh, you know, you can see the quarterback stats there and the team leaders at the top if you're following along with us and watching here on YouTube. We thought we may see a little bit more of Henry Beelan the fourth after Riley Leonard's injury. We saw Beelan, of course, play that NC State game where he finishes four for 12 and Duke walks away with a comfortable 21-point win. Uh, but uh, the fact that it hasn't been Henry Beelan because of injuries to him, we've now had three quarterbacks who have taken – some meaningful snaps so far on the season. Kind of what have you seen out of that position uh, post Riley Leonard, Josh? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you head into the season and everyone's talking about Riley, and rightfully so. I mean, he earned that last year. Um, but, you know, we would often ask Coach Elko, Coach Johns, hey, what about the other guys? You know, what, what, what about the rest of the guys in that room? And we would always say, like, knock on wood, but, like, you're one play away, you know, from those guys uh, being in the game. And so – we saw that happen. And so, yeah, Henry, shout out to Henry Beelan. I mean, what a lot of people don't know is even in the NC State game, uh, he had a shoulder injury. Uh, people were, were even commenting a little bit on Twitter that game, like his throwing motion looked weird and he was going to need to quote unquote correct it. Well, the reason it looked weird, it's not his normal throwing motion. Uh, he had, he had an a injury that he was dealing with, upper body injury, and then he's continued to deal with. And from what we've been told, obviously it's not our story to tell. But the nature of the end of the injury, uh, it has to correct itself and heal. There's no like surgery for it. 
So it's one of those things where he's got to rest it. And so, like, you know, that that's the story on Henry. Obviously, Henry can throw a deep ball. Henry can he can get you three yards uh, after contact uh, pretty easily as well as a big big old boy. Uh, and then Grayson. I mean, we heard from Kevin Johns at the beginning of the season for Grayson Lofton said his spring was very tough. He came in as a true freshman, came in early, and the game had just not slowed down for him. And he struggled through st- spring ball. Obviously, from spring ball until week seven or eight when he got his name called, you know, uh, for this team, there was some massive improvements because we saw flashes in the first game against Wake Forest. Um, and then in the UNC game was kind of his coming out party. I mean, Grayson uh, went toe-to-toe with, with Drake May, right? Went toe-to-toe yeah. with who I feel should be the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. Um, and then you saw a, another good set of numbers in the UVA game. So, listen, the quarterback room, in my opinion, has done well. Obviously, Duke's had to dial back their play calling, and uh, they don't have quite as – as uh, Riley had the full playbook. Riley could do anything, and they could call anything. Obviously, as they're dialing that back, even now with Grayson, he has no one to really back him up. Uh, so they're not going to run him for fear of getting hurt. But, man, at the end, what more could you ask for, J.J.? If you needed to call on three quarterbacks throughout this season, each one of them have gotten a conference win. Each yeah. one of them have, have stepped up and done, in my opinion, the best of, to their ability. And so uh, nothing but, but respect for that quarterback room. We're talking about this Duke football team. One game left on the season. And if you're an everyday you're here with us, on Lockdown Blue Devils, you're very familiar with sort of watching us on YouTube and seeing the schedules scroll across the bottom of your screen for basketball and football. Just one game left at this point as it scrolls across this Saturday against Pittsburgh. More on that here in just a little bit. You're also able to look at kind of the team leaders for the Stuke football team this season. Rushing yards, receiving yards, tackles, and interceptions so far this season. If you will, Josh, kind of give me a word on each of the guys at the top spot in these four categories. Sure. I mean, Jordan Waters has had an incredible uh, senior season, uh, 12 touchdowns to go along with their 722 yards. Um, he's really, really, especially early in the season, uh, really kind of uh, distanced himself, you know, as that number one back. Yeah. Obviously, you've got Jacquez Moore and now Jalen Coleman getting into the mix uh, there. And Jacquez has had a great season as well. But uh, just, just shout out to Jordan Waters. He's three, two touchdowns two touchdowns away from tying the single season record and three touchdowns away from breaking it. So who knows how this pit game will go, but I'd love to see them just pad his stats a little bit. Jordan Moore. I'm not going to, I'm not going to brag too much JJ, but you know, uh, one of the things we do at section 17 is we do our preseason stat predictions. And so I predicted Jordan Moore to lead Duke in receptions, yardage and touchdowns uh, receiving. And I I think I'm going to think I'm going to get that one. He's had an incredible season. These last couple of games, he's really turned into, you know, Grayson Loftus' favorite target. And so he's had an uh, incredible year. Obviously, we know the, the background of Jordan making the switch to wide receiver uh, last season from quarterback. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you got Trey Freeman. I mean, listen, undisputed uh, best, you know, best defensive player as far as getting tackles. Um, I mean, he'll, he'll, he will probably break the 100 um, – marker this coming weekend. And then obviously we have the bowl game. Um, and so you'll see that from Trey. Uh, I, you know, I honestly, at the beginning of the season thought that really this was going to be like a Cam Dillon yeah. slash Trey Freeman. It's really been Trey Freeman. He's really been the leader of that linebacking core and between uh, him and, and Dorian Moosey and Nick Morris Jr. And Cam Dillon, those four have really been the rotation and Trey's been the leader. And then man, that fourth one, uh, fifth one, sorry, the one all far right. Uh, Miles Jones, man. I, two interceptions, great numbers. Uh, if you remember, I believe it was like Pro PFF put out like their midseason All Americans. Miles Jones is a midseason All American at cornerback from Duke. His numbers were gaudy. We've not seen him on the field since yeah. that day. So I don't know so, what to say. I don't know what to say about it. I hate it for the guy. He's in his sixth, seventh year, I believe, of college eligibility. And that is due to injury, and he just can't stay healthy, unfortunately, because he's six foot four. He's a corner. It's it's NFL talent. Just he can't stay on the field. Yeah, got a lot going for him, and we'll see if uh, our boy Miles Jones can get back on the field at least one more time wearing that Duke uniform, whether it be this weekend or uh, taking on the bowl game there for Duke. 
Locked on Blue Devils here today. Once again, JJ Jackson and my pal Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. So, Josh, talking about this last game of the season, a home game against Pitt. One more time inside Wallace Wade Stadium. A little fitting that we've had so many high moments at Wallace Wade that you kind of get to end the year at home going for the seventh win of the season. What do we need to know about this matchup in particular? Yeah, first of all, I mean, uh, Pat Narduzzi has, has really owned this Duke football program. Uh, Duke has not beaten Pitt since 2014. Uh, so that's it's a long losing streak for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, and obviously Pittsburgh has had their, their share of struggles this season. This is not the same look or feeling team as you would have, have, have imagined it to be. Uh, give up a lot of run uh, rushing yardage, which plays right into Duke's hands, uh, hopefully. Uh, it's senior day. You know, Duke's going to have 37 seniors walking. Coach Elko's mentioned, you know, you can read into that however you want to read into it. Some of those guys may return. Uh, it's just they want to make sure they get a senior day. And, man, I I, I agree. I, I want to honor uh, those guys. Uh, the majority of those those players that will be walking stayed through the coaching change. And, you know, you got to have a lot of respect for them. And so Duke fans, it's a great opportunity if you're local in the area to come out and support those guys, um, you know, for, for what they've done for Duke football. As far as the gameplay is concerned, I do believe Duke's going to be able to control the, the tempo of this game. I believe Duke's going to be able to control the time of possession of this game. Um, I do have Duke winning this game uh, and heading into the bowl season, just like last year, uh, on a win um, on this Thanksgiving weekend. Which is exciting. One more time to watch Duke in this regular season. Our friends over at FanDuel right now have the Blue Devils favored by six. So this Duke game coming up on Saturday a noon kickoff. We have not had very many of those. We've been no. able to celebrate some long, long days there in Durham on campus. Uh, but this we'll is the first a little early. Yeah, this is the first noon kickoff at home for sure. So yeah, we're doing breakfast. So <laughs> yeah, get used to it. It's going to be awesome. Going to be a fun one coming up on Saturday. All right. Well, Josh, before we get out of here, let's shift a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the Stoop basketball team. They've got a game coming up tomorrow against Southern Indiana. Before we do that, you've been inside Cameron Indoor a couple of times already this season. You're known to go into games from time to time and sit up there and watch the game play out as a fan. You've also been down there on Press Row. Tell us a little bit about your Duke basketball work this season. Yeah, for sure. Uh, shout out to Duke Report, at Duke Report on Twitter. Uh, Freddie Hodges, I believe you may have had Freddie on here a time or two. Um, but Freddie uh, reached out to me. He's not able to do all the games, he asked me to come on board and be a part of what Duke Report's doing. And so that's really cool for me. Um, been able to be at a couple of games already this season on Press Row. It is a unique experience. You're very, very, very close to the action, and you also have knees and feet in your back from the students that are right behind you, which is a, a unique experience. Uh, but, yeah, I, listen, I, know, I understand Duke had that early loss to Arizona, um, and, and no one wants an early loss per se. But I believe this team uh, obviously has the talent to be a Final Four team to make a run. At the end certainly there are some things this team's got to figure out. You know when you do face those teams that have, you know, really solid big men that can score around the basket. I mean, you know, Kyle Filipowski would tell you he's not a rim protector. That's not that's not his game. And so I think the more we can see the evolution of a player like Sean Stewart, um, not that he is seven foot tall. He's 6'9", but he can jump out of the gym. And so I believe he, as he continues to progress, as we saw earlier this week, he had a solid game uh, Tuesday night. Um, I think the more Sean Stewart can progress, the better this team will be because that that pairing of Mark Mitchell, Sean Stewart, Kyle Filipowski, and however Coach Shire uses them in whatever rotation, uh, that's athletic um, and skilled for sure. And, so, and then, of course, you've got the guards. We can't talk about – you know, Duke basketball, I was talking about those freshmen. Uh, McCain, man, McCain, his shot is beautiful. I, every time he shoots the ball, I think it's going in. Uh, he doesn't make every one of them, but every time he shoots it, I'm like, man, that looked pure. Uh, Caleb Foster, Michigan State game was incredible. And he's, he's just finding his rhythm. And then, of course, the two vets now. I guess a sophomore's a vet. Uh, but Tyrese Proctor and Jeremy Roach, I mean, Duke fans, just remember, not every team in the country has two guys in their backcourt that when they have the ball, you're like, okay, we're good. Yeah. Like whatever happens, we feel like they're going to make the right decisions. They're going to have a chance to score. Jeremy Roach is elite in the mid range. He's elite at getting that, getting a shot. 
Tyrese, I mean, Tuesday night, if you, if you're a basketball fan (laughs) and you didn't see Tuesday night's performance by Tyrese Proctor, you need to go back and just watch the, the condensed game on YouTube or whatever. Some of the plays and some of the moves and shots he hit, it's NBA stuff. And so Duke fans enjoy the season. That's all I can say. It's just getting started. I know JJ and I will be talking about it more and more as we continue through, but uh, enjoy the season so far and got some upcoming big games before January. Yeah, six days from now, Duke goes to Fayetteville, Arkansas to take on the Razorbacks. That's going to be a big one for the Stoop team going up against a big front. They've got a lot of kind of talented guards there in the backcourt. The backcourt's been kind of the calling card for Duke this season. Proctor, three straight games without a turnover, really taking care of that basketball. It's in his hands a lot, and he makes sure uh, that he doesn't waste possessions for the Stoop team. We've had some quiet scoring games from Jeremy Roach as of late, like really quiet and not as so much that his shot isn't falling. Duke's just kind of found some better looks, which I think feels pretty good because you know Mm -hmm. some of those bigger scoring nights will be coming later on down the year for Roach this season. Yeah, and Jeremy's the kind of guy, I mean, he's a senior. He he gets it. He's the kind of guy that may have four points, uh, you know, but then with two or three minutes to go in the game and, you know, Duke needing a score, He's the kind of guy that gets the ball in his hand with seven seconds left of the shot clock, and he's going to get off a good shot. And so, like, you know you're going to get that from Jeremy. You know, at the end of the day, just like the football uh, team, JJ, that we mentioned earlier, you know, injuries, uh, you know, staying away from injuries this season will be key uh, for this team. Obviously, Christian Reeves right now is nursing um, a foot injury. Hopefully he'll be back soon. But I think staying away from injury for this team, if they they can stay injury-free or close to it, then we will be uh, we will be talking about a Final Four caliber team come March. Give me one more thing about kind of all right. Where can this Duke team improve? I think a lot of people want to point to uh, some of the things that we've seen on the defensive end of the floor. Possibly the offense has looked pretty great, and you look at like a second half against LaSalle earlier in the week. Duke of seven of eleven from three point. I mean, they have had second halves where they just turn it up shooting from the outside, but against a LaSalle team that does not have a player over six foot five, 30 points scored inside the paint. That's nearly half of them for the Explorers. I know that that was kind of a conversation that we've seen on Twitter the past few days, uh, folks talking about where can this Duke team improve and maybe on the interior. We spent all offseason wondering if a transfer portal big was going to make his way uh, across town to, to join the Duke team. Not the case, but how big of a deal do you think that is, or is this something that Duke's going to be able to kind of work around and find other ways to win? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, he's not didn't come out and say it, but I'm sure Coach Shire would have liked to land a big, you know, in, in the in the portal, and it just didn't happen due to multiple different reasons beyond Duke's control. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, th- now they're having to adjust, and I actually believe the key on this coaching staff, and that's where I'm heading. I believe it's. Uh, I believe it's about the coaching staff, and it's two elements, JJ. First element is defense. How do you adjust the defense when you're playing a high-level opponent, right? You're playing the Kansas. Uh, you're playing a uh, Arizona, right? You're playing one of those high-level opponents. How do you defend uh, the interior? And, and that is going to fall on the shoulders of Jay Lucas. Jay really sets a lot of Duke's defensive scheme and kind of runs that part of the program for Duke. And so, and I mean, Jay, Jay's incredible, uh, low key. He's my, he's my favorite dude on the coaching staff. Um, so I really like Jay, but I think a lot's going to fall on his shoulders and you saw an improved Duke defense last season. I believe you're going to see more improvement as this season goes on. It's just going to be different. Your defense is going to look great when you got Derek Lively, yeah. you know, at the back of it, swatting stuff into the fifth row, you know, so and you don't have that this season. So, you know, that, that's going to be challenge. Number one is, uh, not necessarily the players on defense, but the scheme and the coaching and how we're going to do that. And the second part of coaching is finding a rotation. Listen, I mean, Tuesday night, TJ Power comes in, goes three for four from three-point line. He's a five-star recruit, yeah. right? He's technically, if Christian Reeves is playing, he's probably your 11th man. 10th or 11th, depending on him or, or Christian, however you want to play that. That's, that's a difficult thing for Coach Shire. Uh, keeping these guys not just happy, but keeping them all bought into the, to, to what's going on, the team first mentality. And then by the time you get to February, end of February, beginning of March, you're expected to kind of have that eight to nine deep rotation. Who is that going to be and how is that going to play out? 
to me, those are my big questions, the defensive scheme and the rotation. How is that going to play out? Well, we'll see it develop over the next few days. Southern Indiana tomorrow night, Arkansas coming up, a big test against Baylor in the month of December, and then all of a sudden we're going deep into ACC play, and we're going to be mm-hmm. talking about it, you and I together, all season long. Josh, once again, any final thoughts? That you yeah, have? I was going to say, I'm going to be in Cameron uh, tomorrow yeah. night, so follow along at Duke Report for basketball stuff. Um, like I said, Freddie does a great job, but I'll be I'll be tweeting from that account. And so if you want to follow along, I try to – get a Sean Stewart pregame dunk every time I'm there and uh, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I appreciate that support for sure. Yeah, I've, I've caught you ca- uh, chatting from time to time. It looks like with our good pal D- Dustin Shue d- down there on Press Road. Yeah, the so you, you have Dustin on the show. <laughs> we were laughing. We're like, man, we can't sit together because, like, first of all, Dustin's like a cheer, and you can't cheer on Press <laughs> Road. So, like, he's, like, kicking the floor underneath me and, like, Hitting me on the shoulder when something <laughs> crazy happens. I'm like, man, you got to chill. But, you know, I had a great time with Dustin. And uh, yeah. it's really cool, man. It's really neat to be able to cover this, this team. And I will say it's a great group of guys. And they're super fun in the locker room, uh, you know, afterwards with interviews and questions. So, yeah, follow along. Like I said, at Duke Report. Obviously, JJ does a great job talking to different people throughout the week. Man, you do an awesome job with that uh, with Duke basketball. So this is your this is your stop. Uh, to, to take care of all your Duke basketball needs throughout the season, for sure. Thank you for that, Josh. Really do appreciate it. Thankful for you, my friend. Happy yes, Thanksgiving to you and your family. Thanks for being here. Hey, go grab you some green meat casserole, man. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Absolutely. That's Josh Cox on today's show. Please make green bean casserole a part of your holiday plans here today. That's going to do it for our show. We're back at it tomorrow talking more Duke basketball here on Lockdown Blue Devils, the Lockdown Podcast Network is your team every day. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.